Hey guys, my name is Minas, and today we're going to be talking about the embryological development of the diaphragm and the thoracic cavity. And as usual, we've broken it down so simply so that if you're a complete beginner to embryology, you should be able to understand what's going on. So let's begin at the beginning, at the blastula. The blastula is a ball of cells. That's the product of fertilization, where a sperm fertilizes an egg. This ball of cells travels down the uterine canal in, into the uterus, and it implants into the uterine wall. Once it implants into the uterine wall, a process of gastrulation will form the three germ layers. These germ layers are three layers that are going to become you. This is a cross-section of the fetus where we have the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and endoderm. And this is an oversimplification for these right here. This is a cross-section and we're looking at it up. In blue, we have the ectoderm. In red, we have the mesoderm. In green, we have the endoderm. And this little dot, which is a cross-section of a cord, is the notochord. The ectoderm will become the skin and the CNS, keeping it simple. The mesoderm will differentiate. It has three main parts. The most middle part is called the paraxial mesoderm, that will form muscles. The middle part of the mesoderm is called the intermediate mesoderm. It'll form the gonads and kidneys. And the most lateral part of the mesoderm is fittingly called the lateral plates. And there are two parts. There is the parietal and the visceral uh, lateral plate. The endoderm will become essentially the epithelial lining of the GIT. And if you notice from day 19 to day 24, we will have a folding of the whole ectoderm in until it forms a ball which is your whole outside layer of skin as that happens the neural fold will pinch off becoming the neural tube and you'll notice the GIT forming with this open communication being with the yolk sac okay eventually it disappears and you'll have the GIT in the middle around day 28 connected to the body by the dorsal mesentery Okay, and around this ectoderm, that's the amnion. So it's flu fluid-filled sac. Okay, that's a quick introduction to embryology. So now let's talk about the development of the diaphragm and the thoracic cavity together. If you only want to know where the diaphragm comes from because your exam is in two minutes and you want to quickly turn this video off, here it is. The diaphragm is made out of four parts. The septum transversum in orange, the pleuroperitoneal membranes in red, which will fuse with the septum transversum, the muscles, which come from C3, C4, C5 somites, and the dorsal mesentery of the esophagus, in which the crura develop. The pleuroperitoneal folds will fuse with the septum transversum and the esophageal mesentery. That's it. Okay. If you want a deeper understanding, let's keep going. Okay. First, let's look at these images here. It's just four single snapshots in time. These snapshots in time are cross sections, or should I say more accurately, it's a sagittal section looking at it this way. So we have the fetus and the septum transversum. It's a thick plate of mesoderm that lies between the thoracic cavity and the stalk of the yolk sac. It is the beginning of the partitioning of the thoracic cavity and the peritoneal cavity. The septum transversum comes from visceral lateral plate mesoderm and its position changes in these snapshots in time. This is due to the growth of the posterior part of the fetus being much more quickly quicker than the front or the anterior part of the fetus. So this long posterior curved bit grows so quickly that the fetus becomes in this curved fetal position. That position brings down the septum transversum eventually into its final position. The septum isn't enough to form the full diaphragm though. It leaves open this big gaping hole, a connection from the thoracic cavity to the peritoneal cavity. This connection is called the pericardio-peritoneal canals. Looking at this picture, again, three 
pictures in time. This is the cross section. Cut the fetus this way and look at it up. Cutting this way, looking at it up, you'll see this. This is the back, this is the front. So if we cut it here, we're going to flip it this way. And we'll have here the vertebra with the ribs, the aorta, esophagus, inferior vena cava, and these white bits, this is the open communication. This is the pericardio-peritoneal canals. The septum transversum can only grow so much. The rest of it needs to be done by the pleuroperitoneal membranes. With the pericardio-peritoneal canals, there is one on either side of the GIT. So if we look over here, with in orange, in sorry, in orange we have the septum transversum. In green we have the GIT. On either side we have one canal, each of the pericardio-peritoneal canals. Okay, hold that thought. Let's look at this right here. Two again, single snapshots in time. This time we're looking at the lungs as well. So again we cut, looking up, and don't let this antipasto looking picture scare you, we'll go through it. So, only focusing on this one. In blue, we have the lung buds, the first lung that is starting to grow. Surrounding the lung, we have the visceral pleura and the parietal pleura. In between the visceral and parietal pleura, we have the pleural cavity. In green, we have the GIT, here's the neural tube. Here is the heart, and here is the pericardial cavity. And if you notice, the pleural cavity is in open communication with the pericardial cavity. They are not yet partitioned off. How do these partition off? Okay. Initially, we have the peri pleuropericardial folds bulging out, coming from the, musc the, sorry, the thoracic wall. When mesoderm contributes to the pleuropericardial folds, they become the pleurocardial membrane, which grows. This pleurocardial membrane contains a couple of important structures. Not only will it become the fibrous pericardium, but it also holds the phrenic nerves and the common cardinal veins. The common cardinal veins, only one of them is important, the right one. The right common cardinal vein will become the superior vena cava. The left one will disappear into oblivion. We don't have to think about it past this picture. Okay. In orange here, we have the phrenic nerves. This is the innervation of the diaphragm from the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerves and the phrenic nerves are contained in this membrane, the pleuropericardial membrane. Okay. Now, what happens is as the heart develops, focusing the attention back here, as the heart grows, it moves downward. That forces the common cardinal veins to move towards the middle and the pleuropericardial membranes will finally fuse both with each other and the root of the lungs. So, the pleuropericardial membranes, as the heart grows down, which is towards you, grows down, the pleuropericardial, pleuropericardial membranes will fuse with each other, moving the cardinal veins towards the center and also fuse with the root of the lungs. So now we have a continuous pleuropericardial membrane, which is now the fibrous pericardium and the SVC at the top. And so, this open communication is now closed. The, at this point in time, the thoracic cavity is divided into the pericardial cavity and the pleural cavity. Okay. Despite this happening, there still is an open connection between the thoracic cavity and the peritoneal cavity. This was the pericardio-peritoneal canal. 
which is the problem now with, that has to be sorted out. These canals are closed by the pleuroperitoneal folds. What happens is, let's just focus one, two, three. These grow towards the front of the body and downwards into the canal until it is completely fused by week seven with the dorsal mesentery. So this grows until it's fused with the dorsal mesentery and the septum transversum. Once that happens, the division between the pleural and the peritoneal cavities are completed. Again, as the pleural cavity expands, we'll notice that this is due to the lungs. The lungs, being buds here, grow filling the thoracic cavity, pushing everything downwards as well. The mesoderm of the body wall will form or contribute to the muscle layer of the diaphragm. That is by C3, C4, C5 somites. So the muscular component of the diaphragm is from myoblasts that originate from somites at C3, C4, C5. Okay, so in week four, we'll notice, right, right at the beginning, the septum transversum is close or opposite to C3, C4, C5. This is how the phrenic nerves are responsible for its innervation. Because the phrenic nerves are from C3, C4, C5, and the septum transversum is lying opposite it. But its final position is not at the cervical leather level, rather it's at the thoracic level. And so that is why when we have the, I'm paying attention to this image, when we have the pleuropericardial membranes growing, the phrenic nerves are moving into the fibrous pericardium and they also move down. And so that's why the phrenic nerves that come from C3, C4, C5 end up innovating something that lays opposite to the um, thoracic uh, segment. But since most of the peripheral components of the diaphragm are from the thoracic tissue right here the most peripheral parts of the sensory component of the diaphragm that's from the intercostal or thoracic nerves okay now let's summarize the video keeping things super simple so that now you'll be able to understand your textbooks the diaphragm it comes from septum transversum septum transversum will become the central tendon it comes from the pleuroperitoneal folds which will fuse with the septum transversum and the dorsal mesentery of the esophagus. The dorsal mesentery of the esophagus, which the crura develop within, and the musculature of the diaphragm, which are from levels C3, C4, C5. So somites C3, C4, C5 are, develop, are contributing to the musculature of the diaphragm. Okay, the phrenic nerve. It innervates the diaphragm, it's at level C3, C4, C5, but the diaphragm lies within the thorax, pretty low, nowhere near the cervic, cervical chain. Why does that happen? As the lungs grow down, pulling everything towards it down, and with the growth of the fetus from the back, the phrenic nerve eventually comes, passes, through the fibrous pericardium all the way down innervating the diaphragm and just a clinical pearl this is how we get referred pain when you have some diaphragmatic um, irritation so if you have a biliary colic or if you have some sort of bleed within the peritoneum that um, can irritate the diaphragm you'll have shoulder or back pain this is because the C3 to C4 C5 dermatomes are within that and so it's called referred pain, where there's nothing actually wrong with your shoulders, but it hurts because of the referred pain from diaphragmatic in innovation. Okay, so that's the end of this video. I'm actually going to include the huge summary 
of this in the description. So if you want something for your notes, just copy and paste from your description. Um, feel free to contact me with any questions you have or even just to say hi. I reply to every single one and I love hearing from everyone. So if it's about a question about anything or just to even say hi, you can add me on Instagram, Facebook, or just leave a comment. I see all the comments and I try and reply to them as, as much as I can as well. So thank you so much, guys. Much appreciate you watching the video. See you next time.